And testing, testing, one, two, three. Uh, let's make sure that we are live. And I... let's. Yeah. Okay, I need to mute myself because I can hear feedback from the YouTube thing, but there we go. That's muted. Okay, we are streaming. Am I? Yes, we are streaming, Chris. Sorry, Jew is. I wasn't paying attention. Um, if, uh, Chris is now missing from the video feed. Fantastic. <laughs> Chris has just gone missing. I'm completely invisible. This is just the weirdest thing. Chris, you've disappeared from my video feed. Uh, wait. I'm definitely still here. I am st should still see me. I know, but oh, in the YouTube feed, YouTube is not, it's not sending you through to YouTube. That's because of that little error I mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, I was. I was okay, wait. Okay. I am Looks going... like I'm here now, though. I can see it on the live stream. Uh, see, okay, yeah. Can you I see, can see it? the chat as well? The chat is saying I'm here. Do they see you? Yep, they see me. Okay, that is the oddest thing because I've lost my mouse. There you are. Oh, that. Yeah, Thaddeus says Chris materialized. <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna give me heart attacks. I use OBS guys and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Finally, uh, yeah, I had to reinstall my computer uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, I had some had some serious oddities and I reinstalled everything. So anyway, thank you, Chris, for being here. I'm very honored to have you on again as a guest. Hey Thunderous, we see Chris. Welcome, <laughs> Thunderous, good to see you. Um and Thaddeus, fantastic. Welcome everyone. So yeah, we have a big audience. There. Well, yeah, getting busy tonight again. Um, Chris, how have you been? I've been doing well. Yeah, uh, busy studying as always. Busy looking at new uh, new aspects of Islam, new things I can bring up at the corner. So uh, yeah, same old, same old. Thank you for having me uh, back on your channel. Yeah, no, um, thank you for for for, uh, for being here again for following up with part two of uh, Dummies and Jizia. The part one was was really really good. Um, guys, just here, a little bit of news. Um, as you know. Yesterday, I did an off-the-cuff stream. My throat was, was wrecked, but um, I, there's a tool that I showed everyone called pdfgpt.io, which allows you to feed a PDF file up to 1,000 pages to this, so to this engine, which indexes it and then allows you to chat specifically to that document, to search through it, to talk to it like you would with ChatGPT, but you're talking to that document. You can interrogate it ask it questions, ask it to give you summaries, ask it to give you specifics. Now, this is a few weeks old, this technology, right? There's a couple of companies doing this now, and I'm hoping to at some point implement this directly myself uh, so that I can hopefully learn to utilize better indexing. But a couple of factors that come into mind. First of all, the quality of the engine that you're using to do the queries, which is GPT 3.5 versus 4. Two, the quality of the indexing and also the parameters that were set. Um, on the software, the temperature, the setting called the temperature, wasn't isn't set very well. It should be higher. It's too low. So this leads to a slightly repetitive nature of the responses. And um, what is the quality of the indexing? We don't know. But it still allows me to search through a particular book. So I was feeding it product manuals, technical manuals, the New Testament. And you can ask it, you know, give me the references where Jesus claims to be God. And it explains these to you and it talks you through this and it says, what are the linked references for this and for that? Or, you know, what about this and that within that document? And it's impressive. So definitely a worthwhile technology if you're wanting to to learn to do research. But understand if you feed it garbage, you're going to get out garbage. And if you ask stupid questions, you're going to get stupid answers. Uh, Chris, any thoughts from you before we go on? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, uh, I have seen part of that video that you made. Uh, I was watching a little bit of it last night and I was amazed by it. I, I think that's just revolutionary. I think that's going to change how everyone, not just Christians, but hopefully very much so Christians, are getting this information, how we're learning these things, and being able to do it in such a quick and easy way, uh, I, think is, I think is amazing. Um, I definitely plan on using this for my own study. There are lots of documents, a lot of them that you have, Lloyd, um, that I want to go through, put into this tool, and ask my own questions, get my own answers. And yeah, I can't wait to use that. I'm definitely doing that probably in the next few days, to be honest. Excellent. No, thanks. So, yeah, hey, we're pretty much off without a technical hitch. I'm so glad because, man, you know, um, I get so worried that the audio is going to be gobbled. 
<laughs> There's always something. It's never never like plain sailing. So the fact that it's got gone so well so far is good. Yeah. No. Um, look, once you set OBS up well, it works really well. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, okay, guys. So yeah, we need to do part two. My I had a cold, so Chris agreed to delay one day. My throat is much better than it was yesterday. My nose isn't running. Um, it's it's actually was like more like really bad hay fever, and so maybe. But yeah, I feel better than yesterday, <clears throat> but my throat's not 100%, but let's go on. We ended here. So Chris, your, your thoughts on the Demis and Jizia stuff. I, did I add to your arsenal and were you able to A, remember and B, could you apply this information we discussed last time? Yeah, so there are certain things that I think are key points that we you brought on. Uh, a lot of it sort of dwelt around the theme that actually it's a mistake to think of them as kind of like... Um, the, a protected class, but rather it's actually more like a prisoner of war class, uh, particularly in the terms that they use. The um, the back, like the background to those terms is quite prisoner of warry as well. Uh, the fact that this is something that's enforced, uh, this is something that can affect family members as well. Um, the options that they're given in certain circumstances if they don't comply to the rules of dimitude. These things, I think, are, are like really substantial uh, and really significant and the fact that there are so many sources that talk about this as well uh, early islamic sources is is yeah also very very important so from that point of view that's what i've sort of taken in um i will very much want to sort of continue looking at this and seeing what are the hidden gems we can discover and uh and then i get cracking on with study yeah you know something i would love to do one day which might which might be um, something that I've mentioned to Thaddeus, I think I've spoken to you about this, this in the past, but we should organize training classes, training group, you know, pick a topic and I can provide my sources, provide some materials, show people, you know, to teach people how to do this and use this and know it, you know, topic yeah. by topic. Uh, I'd be... I, I just want to jump on that and say, absolutely. I think the stuff that you're coming out with is is absolutely crucial and really relevant to what I do at the corner or what Bob does, what many others do as well at SoCo, but also this, this new way of doing research as well. That's, that's huge. Um, so I, I'm all for that. Any, any kind of teaching of apologetics of polemics is, is like, uh, something I'm really, uh, really into. So I would love to see that happen. All right. No, thank you. So yeah, we should talk about that and maybe plan something, plan, if it's a weekend or something or whatever the case is, um, just to pick a topic and try to teach it as much as I can and teach people also how to do research. Okay, so we we ended up on this slide last time. We spoke about a non-Muslim living in a Muslim state under a treaty should not be killed until and unless he commits a crime which breaks the treaty, like, like dishonoring the Quran, which could mean, oh, touching it without wearing a glove, for instance. You know, because yeah. you're a dirty, unclean kafir. Yes, I'm talking uh, about you. I'm and, thinking of the what's, what's the term are you here at the corner? Uh, Najam? No, there's a word that means like you're not clean. Uh, and I've seen some Muslims get really bothered by this if you touch the Quran. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, the crime of touching the Quran. Yes, or disgracing the Prophet. Disgracing the Prophet means to not believe that Muhammad is perfect. So failure to believe that Muhammad is Najas. There we go, Najas. Thank you, Thunderous. Hey, we we were supposed to do a show, but uh, yeah, a bad timing again. But we'll we'll get back to that, Thunderous. So yes, disgracing the Prophet means to believe that Muhammad is not perfect. That's disgracing the Prophet. Um, <clears throat> we've seen this before. You guys have seen me mention this many times. The unsheathed sword, right? By Ibn Taymiyyah. Just look for the word unsheathed in my database. And of course, um, I believe we may have covered this, you and me together, Chris. But whoever insults the Prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or a disbeliever, killing is prescribed on him who insults the Prophet. It is not permissible to imprison or show favor or ransom him, which is what you can do with dummies. Any Muslim or non-Muslim who insults the Prophet is to be killed and repentance is not sought. And this book goes on and on. The purpose of this book is to explain the Islamic law ruling upon those who insult the final prophet okay and what does that entail the one who insults him is to be killed they're to be killed even if they pay a protective tax in a muslim state so now we've got corroboration of what we just showed before from the powerpoint slide this is the general view that you are killed the scholars have consensus whoever insults is killed the muslims have unanimous agreement upon killing 
it is the ruling that if he insults other than him is to be lashed, and you might be lashed to death. Oh, wow. Uh, Abu Bakr from the Companions of us. So the Shafi is one of the Madhab leaders, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... These are the four, the four, the four Madhab rulers, uh, creators, all agree. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I did not know that all four of them did. Oh, That's no, they do. There's consensus upon the obligation of killing such a person. The Muslims have a consensus that whoever insults Allah, insults his messenger, rejects anything. Such a person is a disbeliever, and I do not know of anyone who differed concerning the obligation of killing such a person. The scholars have consensus that whoever insults the messenger, attributing a defect to him, such a person is a disbeliever. And, of course, the obligation is to kill them, and the Muslim insult is killed. There is no disagreement. This is the view of the four imams and others. Your wow. thoughts, Chris? This book is filled with kill them, yeah. kill them, and kill them. So, so this book is, is kind of got like a, a notoriety to it. Because in the corner, if you bring up Ibn Taymiyyah, you basically get people just immediately say, I disavow this person, I don't follow this. Because they know, and I'm aware of the things that you can kind of find in here, uh, from a high level view. I haven't actually gone into this and looked at it like you have, Lloyd. But I'm aware that if you want to talk about some of the spicier things that you can find in Sunni Islam, this would be a book that you read. Uh, it's also a text that I think a lot of um, ISIS people tend to tend to look into but what i noticed here was and and you see just after that red part and that whoever wait could you go back to it oh, sorry we go that, back to it yeah yeah and that whoever doubts such a person's disbelief that they are too guilty of disbelief so if someone makes an accusation about someone who was a muslim who found a defect to muhammad and attributed a defect to muhammad but they were like no 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 uh, i think you got it wrong abdul i don't think that's correct then, then that person also is guilty. Are they also guilty of disbelief? Wow. Mob mentality. We want to kill them, so d d don't don't ruin the party. Yeah, this is Islam. And look, they, they say here that all four the Imams agree. So look, if there's a Muslim that's saying, well, I disavow Ibn Taymiyyah, okay, bring me the evidence from the Sharia that shows him to be wrong. Please, bring us the evidence. Open the Sharia manual. Show me the law that says, if someone insults Momo, Buy them a plate of cookies and a glass of milk and call them a nice boy. Show me that. It's not even uh, it's not even insulting. It's to find a defect. So I mean, you know, Muhammad. Uh, I don't know. He, his beard wasn't that nice. Like uh, I don't know. It's just just something that. Well, like... don't forget attributing a defect. They're saying he's perfect. If you claim he's less than perfect, yeah. you are insulting him. Yeah. Wow. Arnold Nathaniel, welcome. Anela, sister in Christ. Welcome. Guys, let me know when, when would be a good time and what you would like me to cover if I do a, a tutorial or a training session, like on Zoom or something. We'll do something. Uh, your thoughts again, Chris? Sorry. <clears throat> no, no, that was, that was it. I, I'm just still in shock about this sort of thing, really. Yeah, there is uh, no difference bad, of opinion narrated bad. concerning the killing. <laughs> okay. Well, All of them mention that the one who insults the messenger is to be killed. Okay. There are texts from them that one who insults the messenger is to be killed. Let's continue. Shafi, it is reported that insulting the prophet breaks the covenant, the demi covenant, and such a person is to be killed. Insulting the prophet necessitates that they be killed. When a person does this repeatedly, it is for the imam to kill them. The imam, so your mosque imam, can prescribe killing. Okay? Now, wow. the take that which comes concerning the Prophet and his companions of killing due to the likes of those reasons just given, they call this the political killing because there's a perceived benefit in doing that. This is the political killing. So in other words, the Imam of a mosque can order a political assassination. Am wow. I reading this wrong? That's, that's exactly what I'm reading as well. That's that's insane. They also hold that it is for the imam to give a discretionary punishment with, with killing. Discretionary. So the imam can basically say, right, I've decided that because this guy has said that Muhammad's beard wasn't the best beard, I'm going to, <laughs> at my own discretion, issue a killing on them. Wow, that is, that is crazy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, look, this is page 17. All we've seen on every page so far is kill him, kill him, and kill him. Yeah, I'm going to make notes of this, by the way, as we go through this, because um, it's important for me to remember this so I can check back at a later point. Yeah, so for those of you, this is the summary of the unsheathed sword. This is not even the full version. They haven't. I haven't been able to find the full version. It might be out now. I don't know, but, but the summary is bad enough. 
Offensive Jihad in Quran 65.4 and child marriage. Okay, so Thaddeus and I will be on on Sunday at 7 p.m. Poland time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard, I believe. And we will be talking about child marriage. So that is coming up. We'll be talking about child diddling and child marriage on Sunday. So that is coming up. Offensive Jihad I lost it three years ago <coughs> with Thaddeus. So yeah, maybe it's time I revisit that topic. Um, and okay, so so that I'll take this out of the way. Let's continue here. Commentary on the Creed of Tahawi, okay, by Ibn blah blah blah, and this is from Al Imam Muhammad Ibn Saud, Islamic University. So this is guy, in, this is the guy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, the Institute of Islamic and Arabic Arabic Sciences in America. Al Bukhari and others have recorded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, "By the one in whose hand my life is, the Son of Mary will come down to you as a judge." Just and fair, he will demolish the cross, kill the pigs, and abolish the jizya. Why? Because there will be no more Muslims. The church will be destroyed, right? So, Prophet Muhammad, police be upon him, was sent to all humanity. Had Moses and Jesus been alive, they would have followed him. When Jesus comes down again, he will judge according to the Sharia of Muhammad. Now, that's fascinating. So, your crime is not being a Muslim. And the Sharia that doesn't exist is what Jesus will follow. Uh, any thoughts, Chris? Okay, it's interesting that you say they say Sharia as opposed to like the the Kitab of the Quran or, or whatever it might be. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It is confirmed that the angels are superior to Jesus. Oh my, oh my! Notice that Muhammad is considered superior to Jesus, so Muhammad is superior to the angels. That's a really interesting one. Wow. There are some that try and deny that, by the way. Uh, there are some that try and deny that Muhammad is treated any differently than Jesus. But um, I think I think you may have touched on this last time. But there is every reason to believe that's not how uh, early Muslims like understood that. They think very much so Muhammad is the greatest prophet. Um, in fact, actually, there's a, there's a hadith that says um, he's different from... All the other prophets in like three or four six ways. Six ways. He's six superior ways. to all prophets right, right. before him in six ways. And Thaddeus makes a good point. The Sharia of Muhammad, I thought it was Allah's law. Well, well, well. But for the purposes of the Sharia, as some of you will remember, Muhammad is Allah. They speak with the same voice. They are the same authority. Yeah. So, yeah, let's continue. So, uh, <clears throat> the al Hidayah. this is the major book of fiqh, the major book of fiqh in the Hanafi school of jurisprudence. And the apostle said, fight in the name of Allah and in the path of Allah. Combat only those who disbelieve in Allah. So, he's not saying, eat more vegetables, go jogging and help little ladies across the street. They're talking of jihad as combat. And they say yep. here, the Prophet did not commence combat with the people without first inviting them to Islam. If they respond positively, refrain from fighting them due to the attainment of the purpose, which is to make them embrace Islam by force. If they refuse, invite them to the payment of jizya, 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 jizya. And if they say no, then shall you fight or they shall submit. Okay. Through the invitation, they will come to know that we engage them in battle on account of our deen. Perhaps they will respond positively. So the burden of battle is avoided. So threaten them with violence, and they will see that they are being told to submit because of the rule of Islam over them. If the commander engages them in battle before communicating the invitation, he commits a sin. So you look, don't, don't fight them before you invite them to Islam. And if you do, it's a sin. Nevertheless, there is no penalty due to the absence of there being protection, which arises from deen or their being part of the Dar al-Islam. So it's a bad thing, don't do it, but if you do, it's okay, they've got no protection because they're not Muslims anyway. Thus it becomes like the killing of women and children. So if I take you to a different version of the Daya, it says quite bluntly, you are free to kill women and children. Your thoughts, Chris? <clears throat> wow. So they, they acknowledge it's wrong, but it's effectively, pragmatically, there's no punishment in it anyway. No. And nothing will happen. because. In fact, yeah. they state, if I, if I bring the other version, this is a newer translation of the Hedaya. If I go to the older version, the 1795 version, which I typically use, the 1795 version, yeah, they state that to levy a punishment on a jihadi would be for him to hold back from doing his duty. 
And therefore, whatever he does, there is no punishment so that he will act with, with full dedication and commitment. Hmm. Yeah, this is uh, really interesting stuff. This is, yeah, it's amazing sometimes how blunt things are. It kind of like takes you by surprise, even though I've, I've looked at quite a few of this stuff, but still yeah. never ceases to be like, uh, wow, this is all out in the open. Like it's yeah. not really well hidden or anything. Yeah, I'm happy for someone, a Muslim, to come on and sh- open the Sharia manuals and show me, Lloyd, jihad just means have less jelly babies and more lettuce. <laughs> show me. Oh, the, the amount of times I've heard was jihad just means struggle. It's just a struggle. And it's like, you know, well, it's not like a struggle to get out of bed in the morning. It's a totally different thing than, than what you're trying to make it out to be. Um, and the way that I tend to look at that is through hadith, because there's a lot of hadith that talk about, um, uh, about jihad quite violently. But it's interesting to see that, well, yeah, if the hadith talk about it like that way, the sunnah does, therefore so does the sharia. Yeah, yeah, they're free to kill. If they reject the invitation, seek the help of Allah and engage them in combat. Allah helps his friends and destroys his enemies. Fantastic. So, he may leave the residents settled on it by imposing jizya so they can keep their land. You don't have to steal their land, right? You don't have to steal their land, but you can you, you can make them pay to be there. That's that's what the that's what you do when it's called extortion. An enemy cannot stay permanently in our territory except through slavery or on the payment of jizya. If he stays for a year, so if you go visit the land of the Muslims and you stay for 12 months under Sharia law, you then become a dhimmi, not allowed to leave, right? Because you know too much about the Muslims. You know secrets that you could pass on. Is when he stays after the directive of Iman, he agrees to bind himself to the payment of jizya, thus he becomes a dhimmi. He is not permitted to return to the Dar al-Harb, the land of war. Okay. The reason is that he will then take secrets with him and he can divulge secrets about Islam to other people. The wealth yeah. of the residents of the enemy territory that is gathered by the Muslims without fighting will be spent upon the interests of the Muslims. Jizya is imposed upon the people of the book, not politely requested, imposed, until they pay the Jizya with willing submission. So I think this is pretty blunt. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, definitely. What was really interesting uh, as well to me was, uh, I think it was on the end of the last page, you said... Yeah, I mean, uh, you're supposed to fight them and, and destroy them because they're Allah's enemies, you know, and you yes. are your, uh, you are Allah's friends. You know, there is no understanding of, as you know, uh, you're made in the image of God, you have a distinct objective, innate value, all that is gone. He does not love you whatsoever. Yeah. So, Arnold Nathaniel, welcome. He says here, but doesn't combat mean fight peacefully? It's like it's like all those riots right. in the U.S. Arnold. It's <laughs> like you know all those fires and all those dead, those thirty-something dead people during the BLM riots. It was it was peaceful protests. Mostly peaceful protests. Yeah. Mostly peaceful. <laughs> mostly peaceful car burnings. Mostly peaceful business burnings. Mostly peaceful murders. That that's what it was. So yes, <clears throat> continued in the Hedaya. Their men and women are booty due to the due to the permissibility of their enslavement. If he conquers a territory prior to this, then the men and women are booty to the business. So I take it that also includes the families as well, right? So that yes. would extend. Wow. In fact, the husband and the wife, they, their marriage is dissolved and, and he becomes a slave and she becomes the property of the owner. Wow. Yep. Ooh, um, this stuff is a gold mine. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> Do you want to read this? My throat's a bit stuffed, so maybe you can take a few moments. Would you mind just yeah, reading yeah. this and then we'll, we'll discuss? we Will do. I'll, I'll just focus on the, the yellow bits then. Uh, yeah. So we're looking at Jizya. Jizya is taken from the uh, men of the people of Dimi. Is it Dimia? Dima status. Dima status, right. Um, provided they were free and adult, it's not taken from the women slaves. Or the, okay, fine. Ibn Rashid defines it thus. What is taken from the people of disbelief in repayment for their security and sparing their lives while they remain unbelievers? Right. Security inspector. Yeah, otherwise we would just kill you. Yeah. Uh, Harbi traders paying a tenth. A tenth is also levied from traders who come from the Dar al Hub, the land of war, beyond the frontiers of Islam. So, how do you read that into that? I mean, this is just theft. And they call it the land of war, not France, not Germany, the land of war. 
Wow, okay. So a 10th is also levied from trade. So basically, if, if someone's a trader who happens to come from a, a place where there's ongoing fighting, they... Oh, no, no, that's not Muslim. Wait, how do you mean? The land of war doesn't mean a place where there's war going on. The land of war means the place, the places they should make war upon because those are not Islamic. They're right, so it's land. not even that there's a war there, it's just the intent to take over the land. Yes. Wow, so it's intent, not... Wow, that's... <laughs> Oh, that's, that's insane. Yeah, so the land of war, the Dar al-Harb, is not a place where there is war right now. It's a place where they must make war because you're not a Muslim country. Any non-Muslim country is the, is the land of war. Oh, uh, I see. So it's just de facto perceived as that way because it's the ultimate objective from, I guess, from pretty much every part of the deen that yeah. they are yeah. to spread Islam. Right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so... <sighs> Conociendo el Islam says, I struggle to understand British English. That is his jihad, trying to understand British English. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, Kitab al-Kabir, the Book of Enormities, Reliance of the Traveler, Collecting Taxes, meaning to take revenues other than those which are countenanced by sacred law, such as zakat, the non-Muslim poll tax, or the spoils of war. Fascinating. Okay, so the non-Muslim yeah. poll tax is jizya, and they separate it from the zakat. <clears throat> so, Tafsir Sahih Bukhari, the Fat al-Bari. Now, the Fat al-Bari is the most famous commentary upon the Sahih of Bukhari. And, of course, Sahih Bukhari is the most famous of the Hadith collections, the most, the most authoritative. But understand that the scholars read the Tafsir. We know of Tafsir of we know of tafsir of the Qur'an, if you are aware that, unless you've been watching my channel, they are tafsir of the Hadith. The Fat al-Bari is the preeminent um, book that describes and explains and exegetes the Bukhari Hadith. And it says, yeah. I've been, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, I've, I've heard about this, and it was probably you who I heard it from. Uh, I've not had a chance to really dive into this, though, but it does sound interesting. So, Zakhar asks, what is the percentage of income collected as jizya? We discussed that in the first episode, so please do watch that if you can. But the minimum was a certain weight of gold. Well, was money to the, to the value of a certain minimum weight of gold per year. Now, in today's terms, that weight of gold, but the thing is, it wasn't, that weight of gold would be about $270. However, I mean, it's really, a, but... That is the absolute minimum. There is no maximum set. So if they want more, there is certainly more. Usually it was half your salary, right? Half of what you made. So I guess if, you, if you're completely broke, that's it. You don't really have much of a choice. You can't afford to pay the jizya. So there's, there's nothing else really other than the alternatives that we talked about on the first episode as well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if they're repaying, if they... If they Establish their prayers, they become Muslims, let them go on their way, is basically what he's been saying. But within the Fatal Bari, we learn I've been commanded to fight people until they testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Of course, I would love to see where in the Quran it says the Shahada with Muhammad's name. And in fact, isn't it shirk if, if you want to become a Muslim, you have to say the Shahada, which includes Muhammad. You cannot simply say the Shahada with Allah, or Allah it doesn't count. Wouldn't that be shirk? You're associating a partner with, with Allah. I mean, Chris, doesn't that make shirk? Pretty sure it is shirk. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, you know what's funny? Uh, people actually, Muslims downplay shirk now, like quite significantly, because um, they're aware that there's a lot of cases that can be made that things are shirk. So instead what they do is they say, oh, actually shirk, yeah, it's, it, it's the worst sin, but as long as you're sorry about it afterwards, you're basically fine. Oh. It, they, they'll, they'll, they'll basically say like, oh, um, if you die and the last thing you ever did was commit shirk, then you're in trouble because he won't forgive that. But if, but as long as you're sort of like, oh, sorry, that wasn't good, then you're fine. So as long as he's sorry, Allah will forgive the crime he doesn't forgive. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's their view. They, yeah. they hold that theologically because they, they know otherwise they're in for some interesting, uh, interesting takes. Yeah, and then, so notice, the people of innovations are not disbelievers as long as they declare the Tawheed, the unity of Allah, and accept the Sharia, right? 
So, Sharia seems to be important, and we understand from the Hadith that whoever restrains from declaring Tawheed should be fought. Okay, so how can we leave fighting those who pay the jizya and make pacts? So, basically, what this says is that if you don't declare Tawheed, you must be fought, right? So, you even if people do pay the jizya, you still ultimately want them to convert. Ultimately, that is still your aim. You're pressuring them slowly but surely, grinding them down to eventually submit. The yeah. intent of the jizya is so that they would be coerced towards Islam until they enter Islam or accept what will lead them to Islam. And Allah knows best. And you could sort of add to that. Or they reject Islam explicitly and then we kill them. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Because then they're insulting the Muslims and insulting Allah. So, mm. the Muqtasar al-Quduri. So, I've seen mention of this. Okay, so other channels. Are, so, put it this way. Like three years after I came on the scene and everyone was going, what nonsense is this Lloyd guy talking? He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not using the Quran. He's not using the Hadith. He clearly doesn't know Islam. Three years later, now I've kind of gone mainstream, which is great. But also, other people started using the materials. But many of, I've seen them use this Muqtasar al-Quduri. Understand this is not an authoritative book. It is basically, it's like when you go to, when, you, when you're three years old and you go to kindergarten, they give you your first naughty reader, right? This is like the first naughty reader for imams, okay? So this is like when you go to the kindergarten level of becoming an imam, this is what they give you. And they say, here, this has got small words. It's written in crayon, okay? <laughs> learn, learn some Islamic law, okay? This is not the be all and end all. This is just where they begin. Right, <clears throat> but from the Muqtas al Qaduri, it's so moving on. I mean, the, the hadaya would be like where they finish. But anyway, lying to non-Muslims, cheating them, and backbiting them might become permissible, as may killing them. Uh, can you tell me where in the New Testament Jesus says that lying to non-Christians, cheating them, backbiting them, and killing them is definitely permissible? It's, it's just like you take everything good and you flip it upside down and then you get this. In fact, it, in fact, I think it would actually take quite a feat to come up with something worse or just as worse as this. Yeah. It's, it's, and yeah. the Muslim is not to lose sight of Islamic injunctions. Clearly, one may not be nice to people at the expense of compromising Islamic principles. So general humanity goes out the window. You're not to have, you know, common, agreed respect, mutual respect, but rather no. What you need to do for Islam is, is, is paramount over all else. Yeah, you might have to lie, cheat, and kill for Islam because those are the Islamic principles and don't you forget it. So I hope you guys understand just how utterly immoral and depraved Islam really is. And Muslims need to be challenged. This is their law. I would love them to show me where I'm wrong. I had some fool come on in, in the comments recently and say, well, Lloyd, why did you skip over the other paragraphs? I was like, okay, come on live with me. Show, let's show those paragraphs and let's see what I missed. Show me, show me the stuff I missed. By all means, of course, nobody has yet taken me up on that invitation. And it's never going to happen because those nice passages do not exist. The prophet said, even if Moses were alive on the earth today, Moses would have no option but to follow Muhammad. <laughs> would have no option. <laughs> it kind of sounds like they, they know full well Moses wouldn't follow him. In fact, he'd probably denounce him as a, as a false prophet. Um, so the very, <laughs> the very fact they say Moses would have no option. He's going to follow Muhammad. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's quite telling. Yeah. Okay, so the religion of slavery. So let's have a look at this wonderful cartoon. What do you think of this handsome, strong black slave, O Prophet? Half the price for you, handsome, but he will be guarding my harem. And he says, well, no problem. It's a sale. Well, let's have a look at the religion of slavery here. Anas reported that a person was charged with fornication with the slave girl of Allah's messenger. Oh, Muhammad had slaves? I'm shocked. There, <laughs> thereupon, Allah's messenger said to Ali, go and strike his neck. Ali came to him and he found him in a well, making his body cool. Ali said to him, come out. And as he took hold of his hand and brought him out, he found that his sexual organ had been cut. Ali refrained from striking his neck. He came to Allah's apostle and said, 
He has not even his sexual organ with him. Thank you very much, Psalm 51. Much appreciated. So, yeah, I guess this is a wonderful moral story. Yeah. He found that his sexual organ had been cut. Yeah, also, it doesn't make sense. Like, uh, it's not like a definitive argument, right? Like, he could have done something with his sexual organ after the event, not before. Unless it specifically says he did it after. But it doesn't seem to be saying that. Yeah, you know, well, as in like, yeah. Also, it's just a really horrific story that doesn't really make much sense. Given that Muhammad, what this really boils down to is someone who is not Muhammad cannot have sex with Muhammad's slave girls. But Muhammad can have sex with the slave girls. So look, in other words. <laughs> all of the implications here are horrific. No matter how you look, this is Islam. This is Islamic morality. And we are supposed to accept this. I mean, these are crimes, all of them. From a Western point of view, and wh why I, to Muslims? Please explain to us. Explain to me why we have to accept this when these are illegal. These are crimes under our law. Yeah, you know? I mean, absolutely. would someone please criticize Muhammad and call him wrong and having committed a crime and a sin for having slaves? Jesus had no slaves. Muhammad owned slaves. Muhammad had slave girls. Jesus had no slave girls. So why should we accept this? Okay, Shafi's Risala. Now, Shafi wrote two Risalas. They were about 30 years apart. He wrote the first one when he was living, I believe, in Baghdad or something. Then the second one, I believe, he wrote somewhere in Cairo. Once he went to Egypt and he learned some of the Sufi magic, I guess. Right? Something like that. So the, the, two, word, the, the two books are separated by 30 years. The Risala is no longer, shall we say, it's not that it's not authoritative. It's just like the Muqtasar al-Qaduri. It's just that they are, they are obsolete. They've, those works have been built upon and absorbed into other works. So, for instance, while Shafi founded the Shafi'i school of fiqh and is responsible for much of the Sharia as a whole, right? he is not the preeminent scholar within. Yes, he is the, he's like the, the major scholar in terms of his status, but the scholar that capped a lot of the Shafi school basically was Nawawi. Nawawi basically completed that whole that whole thing. It took hundreds and hundreds of years to write this. Haven Bang, welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, basically, so all of this has been incorporated into books like The Reliance and to other books. So, while Muslims can throw this at you, it is certainly not something that, that shall we say, is... It's, it's like going to, like, a, a primary school textbook rather than going to university-level textbook. You understand? Okay, so slay the polytheists, line ambush for them everywhere. Okay, but if they, you know, become Muslims, well, let them go. Fight those who do not believe in Allah, who do not practice the religion of truth, of those who have been given the book until they pay the jizya out of hand and have been humbled. And the apostle of Allah said, I shall continue to fight the unbelievers. And now we go here. Umar accepted the tradition of Abd al-Rahman concerning the Magians, the, these are Iranians, he collected the jizya on the basis of the Quranic communication, 929, until they pay the jizya out of hand and have been humbled on the basis of the Quran, which states that the unbelievers should be fought until they accept Islam. They're not qualifying this by saying, well, you know, this is only valid until the 19th of August, just after the fall in, in 637. None of this is qualified. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I could see where this was going. Uh, as I was kind of reading this, I thought, huh, this sounds like um, a lot like the hadith where Muhammad explicitly says, look, I've been commanded to to wage jihad on those until they establish prayer, they pay zakat, and then their life and property will be safe for me. Uh, and then, yeah, 929 came up. Yeah, I, I, I figured that all this would be, all this would be here. You know, so thank you, Haven Bank, for joining and becoming a member. Much appreciated for all the support. Yeah, Chris, <clears throat> this is shocking to me. I mean, this is all over. I mean, this is within the most authoritative books. This was this was written by Shafi himself, basically. Okay, so now this is the Kitab al Siyar al Sagir. Okay, notice it is the book of Muslim international law. This is not American international law. This is not British international law. This is not even UN international law. This is just the Muslims have their own law called Muslim international law, Muslims versus the world. And notice up top here, it says it's from the 100 great books of Islamic civilization. Because several 
major universities backed by certain Islamic governments decided to translate their most important works, the most relevant of their works, into English. Right? As we all know, one of the very, very earliest, one of the very first of those was the Reliance of the Traveler. Why would they spend years and tons of money translating it if it wasn't important? And if this is one of the hundred great books of Islamic civilization, let's learn what it says. Now, now I should let you guys know that they believe that Muslims created international law. We are very proud of our history that we created international <laughs> law. In fact, we wrote the first book on international law. Look how advanced we are. Ladi da di da. The Army's Treatment of Disbelievers. You should read this book. It's got it's kill him all over the place again. But yeah, let's just have a look at this section. So so when was this uh what, what is the date of this? Oh, uh, yeah. good grief. You know what? Actually, let me find it for you. Is it uh is it like a modern thing or cuz cuz it says Muslim international law which kind of implies to me oh, okay maybe this is more of a modern thing but then uh okay yeah, here we go so shibani kitab al siyara sagir uh radio i'm bringing it up uh okay hold on a second <clears throat> just getting it over uh mom mom when was this written that's a good question so if someone could google this for me please this one was okay. This version is published in '98, but when was the book written? I'm gonna guess here. I'm gonna say the 12, 1300s. Okay, okay. It's gonna be my guess. Um, if someone could please look that up for me, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, let's let's continue. Hopefully, uh, someone in the chat will solve it for us. <clears throat> uh, let me just see if I've missed any comments or questions. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Okay, so whoever fights, okay, so if an ambush is made against disbelievers in the daytime or the night without formally inviting them to Islam, it makes no difference. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I thought there'd be some sort of like, yeah, you know what, you really shouldn't do that. But, but no, it just makes no difference. Yeah, because I can, I told you, if you go deeper into the Hedaya, it states you know, you, you need to invite them to Islam before you take action. You first have to give them, but if you do just go there and kill them and you forget or you don't do it, ah, it's okay, don't worry about it. Have a nice day, go kill some more. That literally says that. Because I guess if, if you don't think there's like any value in the person you're killing, it kind of doesn't make sense to punish someone for it because yeah. they don't have any value anyway. So what's the big deal? That's really yeah. interesting. Notice there is no harm if the Muslims demolish blah, blah, blah. You can go, go destroy their stuff. It's fine. When a group of guaranteed citizens breaks the covenant, so guaranteed citizens are the al al -dimma. They have a guarantee of not being killed as long as they follow the rules, right? Okay. That when they move away to the territory of war, the Dar al Hab, so any place that is not Islamic is the territory of war. Joy yep. Pai, thank you for joining. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you so much for all the support for the channel. I really appreciate it. So any place, any territory, any parcel of land that is not Muslim is a territory of war and also called the territory of disbelief, okay? So the territory therein is territory of disbelief, which must be controlled, and then they move to the territory of war. You are people of rebellion. That's another thing. Christians, for instance, are people of rebellion, right? Okay. And the Muslims are the people of justice. Which is weird because Christians historically weren't known for being rebellious, like quite the opposite. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just this is their propaganda, right? The yeah. prohibition of warlike operations during the sacred months oh, has been abrogated. And it says Quran 9.5, slay the polytheists wherever you find them. Oh, wow. Okay. So this book of Muslim international law, the very first book of international law, written by Muslims who are so proud of this achievement in the world, the first, the first civilization to create international law. Well, yeah, they don't seem to like you very much. So, yeah. oh, Jesus. Mo is Jesus. And um, a special section called What the Fifth? <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. So the prophet was born circumcised with his umbilical cord cut. And his mother Amana said he was born clean. There was no impurity on him. This is Quran, page 23, as I recall, the miraculous birth of Mo. Because, you see, within the Jewish law, a boy is circumcised after eight days. So Mo, of course, had to go one better. So he was born circumcised. Isn't that just awesome? From, again, the Sira. 
And I, I think that also sorry? contradicts. Uh, I think there's other sources that say he was circumcised on the seventh day. I could be wrong, but yeah, I think there's like contradiction in the sources there. Uh, Ronan like, Ramirez yeah. makes a very good point, but Christianity came first. If anything, Islam is rebellion against Christ, and I have to agree with you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Thanks. On Nathaniel says, Kitab al-Siyar al-Sagir is a classical book written by a prominent Islamic jurist, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shebani, who lived from 749 to 805. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's really early then. This is very early. Thank you for, for looking that up, uh, Arnold. If I missed any other comments, please forgive me. Um <clears throat> Because like, uh, you see how that would like change the whole thing. If if like if this was written in the eighties or something, then then that would be like a totally different thing than if it's written back then. For for two reasons, right? Like if it's like really modern, it would mean wow, they're still publishing and writing this stuff. If it's really early, like this is, it means wow, this is what the original and closest to the Sahaba actually went with. So either way, it's horrifying. Yeah. So Lydia says, yeah, he was born wirelessly. You know, the, the guy was on Wi-Fi. <laughs> and Thaddeus says, this explains a lot. No umbilical cord, no oxygen to his brain. And yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And Aisha says, I never ever saw the private parts of the messenger of Allah. May Allah bless him and grant him a penis. Wait, Sorry. what? I never ever saw the private parts of the messenger. Are you calling Aisha a liar, Chris? Oh, no. Heaven forbid. Uh, heaven forbid. Although most Muslims do call Aisha a liar because they reject one of the Sahih Hadiths that said that no one saw, that Muhammad never saw his Lord and Muhammad never prophesied. Uh, that's actually in a Sahih Hadith, but most Muslims ignore that. Um, wow, I never ever saw the prophet. That is so weird. Isn't that amazing? I mean, look, you guys have, I've shown you guys this in the past. Yeah, I just, well, I just opened up my um, OneNote and you guys saw a little bit of my, um, my code that I was using to do some, some Python code. Um, okay, so. Notice that Isha also says this. This is Sahih, by the way. Once she angrily said to the messenger of Allah, it is you. <laughs> Wait, what? Really? Uh, Sunni references, wow, Al-Ghazali. Yeah. What? So Al-Ghazali is a name you can put to that? Yes. This is that legit. That is amazing. Hang on, let me let me take let me make notes of this. this screenshot, <laughs> screenshot. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, need anything, saying, like, let I me to, know. I, I mean, I'll be out. happy. But but understand, Al Ghazali is the single most acknowledged and revered scholar in Islam after Muhammad himself, and you know, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. Now, the odd thing is, if you go to these books, some some copies, some versions of the books that I'm quoting here have removed that sentence. Oh, yeah, I wonder why. I wonder why that might be. <laughs> yeah, some of them have removed it. So one guy said, well, you know, here's the page, here's the book, and it's missing. And I said, well, here's another version of the same book, and it happens to be here. Now, why is your copy missing a whole paragraph? Oh, wow, uh, that is that is devastating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are we going to call Aisha a liar now, more than once? <laughs> Well, you know, in Islam, they have to throw all their scholars under the bus eventually. So I guess technically you could kind of think of uh, Aisha as a scholar, just a very small scholar. So uh, maybe she just gets thrown under the bus as well. Yeah. So, so yeah. Wh why would they even put this? This is an award from Qadi Iyad. Okay. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, Ashifa of Qadi Iyad. This is a highly respected biography of Muhammad. Why would she, why would they even print this? I never ever saw the private parts of the Messenger of Allah. It's like, what? But Ali also, said, what? the Prophet asked me to be sure that no one except me washed him. Muhammad said, no one has seen me naked without going blind. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. No one except me washed him. What? Wait, so that also includes Aisha. Because Aisha never saw his private parts. <laughs> <laughs> so what Muhammad was actually doing was a great mercy because um you know if if he had actually revealed himself fully to Aisha he would have blinded Aisha so yeah <laughs> so oh. thank you solo scriptura thank you thank you very much i'm so <laughs> grateful so yeah so this is this is basic you can see marked safe from Muhammad today <laughs> 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 Islam is ridiculous. I mean, good grief. And this is this is a very highly respected manual. This is so dumb. Exactly. Sustain Christ, this is dumb. 
I mean, this is dumb beyond belief. But why why would this ever come up in conversation? Like why would Aisha ever have to tell anyone, narrate a story of her never seeing the private parts of him? Actually, I can think of a reason why. Or at least sort of anyway. Uh if there was ever any controversy about controversy about what Muhammad was doing with Aisha, perhaps it might be related to that. Saying she's like, No, no, I never actually saw the private part. I don't know. Just maybe just the, the, yeah, the look that so guys there there is the um so okay, so someone mentioned a deformity. So hold on, let me just start. I spell really well, but I type very badly. So okay, so there's a there's a condition that someone mentioned to me called hypospadias, I believe. So this is where the little hole in your winky is not in front, but it's below. Uh, okay. Remember that Momo had to. Remember the hadiths all talk about Momo would sit down like a woman to take a pee? Mm, yes, there's contradicting hadith to that, I think, as well. But yeah. So the reason for that being that, it, I mean, the risk was probably he would pee all over himself because also, remember, he had no children. I mean, there's stories he had children and there's all sorts of wonderful stories, but but none of them survived. So maybe there was something wrong. But but this is this condition could be that he might have suffered from that kind of sexual condition. Interesting. Yeah, there's there's a lot you can do if you want to do like um kind of like. What could be a failed circumcision? Lydia says, yeah, I mean, who knows, right? Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah, really interesting stuff. Muhammad's moss cloth didn't get covered in semen for no reason, just saying. <laughs> moss, yeah. Oh yeah, man. There's like two dozen of these of these claims by Aisha that Mo was like coming all over himself constantly. I mean, she mentions yeah. it like two dozen times. I mean, I don't want to scratching it with the nails. So what? She scratch would scratch at the semen with her nails. I always find that just oh, that just is so horrible. Yeah, I mean this is just disgusting. Disgusting. Okay, so okay, cleanliness is next to moliness. Okay. <laughs> I've not smelled amber, musk, or anything more fragrant than the smell of the messenger of Allah. Okay. For instance, I felt a cool sensation. His hand was scented. It was as if he had taken his hand from a bag of perfume. If he shook a man's hand, the fragrance would remain for the whole day. If the Prophet placed his hand on the head of a child, that child could be recognized among other children by the fragrance. It's like, that's why Joe Biden has been sniffing little kitties. He's, <laughs> <laughs> He's actually on like a, a worldwide mission to find out who are the to children. Find out, yeah. <laughs> Anna's mother brought a bottle in which to put Muhammad's sweat. Wow. The messenger asked about it. She said, we put it in our perfume and it is the most fragrant of scents. In his great history, Al-Bukhari mentioned that when the Prophet went down a road, anyone who followed him knew that he had passed that way because of his scent. The Prophet's fragrance occurred without the use of perfume. The Prophet let me ride behind him, so I put my mouth on the seal of prophethood and spread over me like musk. Oh, the seal of prophethood. That's the uh, disgusting. That's Dis the egg, the the pigeon egg, uh, mole, on his shoulder blade, right? Yeah, or, or totally not idolatry. There. Tony says definitely not worship. Yeah, it is. It's, it's. I mean, this is just like like where are these stories about Jesus. I mean, look, there's the story of Mo pulling up his clothes and some guy was kissing his chest and stomach, and you're like. Okay, man, I saw that in a movie once, and it, it wasn't one you know, <laughs> that, that, that I want to remember, right? Okay, so Ali said, I watched the prophet, and I began to look for what is normally found in a corpse, but did not find anything. A sweet smell came from him like those I've never experienced. When Abu Bakr kissed the prophet after his death, he said something to the same effect. Malik ibn Sinan drank his blood on the day of Uhud and licked it up. The prophet allowed him to do that and said, the fire will not touch you. Oh, oh, wow. Something similar occurred when Abdullah ibn Zubair drank Muhammad's cupped blood. He did not object. A woman drank some of Mo's urine. He told her, you will never complain of a stomachache. But we are told that blood and urine are, and feces are the three most disgusting, vile things. Yeah. Well, actually, urine is, is the main cause for, for hellfire, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it seems very risky for someone to go near urine and a woman as well, because they're the majority in Hellfire. So you, yeah. you really got to be careful. <laughs> if you spill this urine as a woman, 
It's not, it's not looking yeah, it's too good. Yeah, it's good for you. You'll never have a stomachache. He did not order any of them to wash their mouths out, nor did he forbid them to do it again. The hadith of the woman drinking his urine is sound. Okay. And she said, I got up and felt thirsty, so I drank Muhammad's urine without knowing it. Look, man, I don't know about you guys, but I, I have a nose that works. Okay. I can <laughs> smell. Like, oh, this doesn't smell like water. I think I'll stay away from this. But, okay, this is Mo we're talking about, so very, very special. Um, does anyone, are there any New Testament stories of the apostles drinking Jesus' urine? In fact, are there any references to the stories of his urine that, that we should be aware of? No, no, it's almost as if the gospel writers didn't think they were important because they, well, on earth, which, why? And even, like, you might find Gnostic material that comes up with weird stuff like this because there's a lot of stuff in, like, um, the Gospel of Thomas that says, like, Jesus, if I remember correctly, it says, like, Jesus killed kids and stuff. But yeah. no one takes this as, as uh, like, part, as part of the canon. This stuff is written a century scripture. or two centuries after Jesus died. Yes, and, right? and the reason is clear. It's because he never did it. Like, it never did anything like this whatsoever. Diabetes, sweet urine, Andrew Martin says. That's a good point, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, this stuff is crazy. So please ask Muslims about this. This is all over the Sira. If there's something they want to hide more than the Sharia, it's the Sira. Because, man, this is this is only getting started on this stuff. The Sira is it's just off the hook when you start looking at, at just what they say about Mo in the Sira. Yeah, what I've noticed is um, people don't really know this. Like Muslims, I don't think, have any idea about this whatsoever. In fact, I'm pretty sure you've had the same experience. And I think that bringing this up is interesting because there's just no built-in defense to this. So they all know about Hadith. They all know about uh, Muhammad doing inappropriate things with Aisha. And they have kind of uh, at least some idea as to how to tackle that, right? You know, oh, that's not a good enough Hadith. I don't like Bukhari. I'm going to put my fingers in my ears. Whatever it might be. They have some way of dealing with it, but... With this, I think all of this is kind of new to them. Unless well, they, they've been really like, they've really dig down on this, but I don't think most Muslims have. Yeah, so yeah, she was so thirsty she drank urine. Yes, Andrew, that, that's how thirsty she was. Yeah, that's the thirst of diabetes. Yeah, ugh, disgusting. So this is, so did you guys know that Islam is the religion of bottled peace? It's not just the religion of peace, it's the religion of bottled peace. Right here. <laughs> Saudi authorities closed down shops selling traditional camel urine drinks after discovering their owner had been filling the bottles with his own bodily waste. <laughs> uh. Oh my god. <laughs> it's the religion of bottled peace. So, yeah. <laughs> I bet he thought he had, like, cottoned on to, like, infinite money. <laughs> you know, this, it's like, huh, have I had an infinite supply? I mean, and pretty much infinite demand. <laughs> why would non-Muslims view this and go, yeah, that's legit. I want some of that. <laughs> I mean, just disgusting. I'll take my chance with bacon. Bacon is better than peace. <laughs> okay. So, so guys, uh, bacon inoculates me from this disease. Okay. I take, I take bacon vaccine. That's good for me. <laughs> Okay, so Muhammad is like a peace mixed with milk because peace on its own doesn't taste so good. <laughs> okay, maybe I should stop with the peace yeah. jokes now. <laughs> Actually, just, just real quick, someone said, why is it red? And yeah, I don't know if it's the light, but some of the bottles in the center kind of look a little... It's just the shadow, I guess. Just, okay, who knows? it better um... be the shadow. <laughs> Otherwise, that guy has a quality control issue that you should probably have checked out. But yeah. Okay, Muhammad is like their peace mixed with milk because peace on its own, yeah. Yeah, guys, um, yeah, so by the way, just please use lowercase in the comments. Please do not go all caps, all right? Uh, so revenge is best served cold. Peace tastes better when fresh and warm. So, yeah, okay, enough talk about peace. Okay, so briefly, <laughs> an another side, Dawa manuals and training abound. So reasoned answers, okay? This was, but this guy gave up. I'm taking a Dawa course right now. I'll come back to you, okay, about that. Okay, but, okay, notice here. The Gorap approach, God's existence, oneness, revelation, and prophethood. So basically, Muslims are taught how to defend Islam. Okay? Um, <clears throat> an effective structure to introduce the foundations of Islam is the Gorap, which stands for... So understand, Muslims learn Dawah. They actually go on courses. They do trainings on how to deal with this. Okay? Yeah. There's, uh, there are some people at the corner, some of the more celebrity types who have set up their own courses selling this kind of material. Yep. Uh, so they profit from this. 
Yeah, and they say during Dawah conversations, you are likely to be asked uncomfortable questions relating to topics such as terrorism, hijab, homosexuality, polygamy. Now you can add the things Aisha said, the things people were <laughs> drinking, Mo's blood, Mo's urine, just urine in general. Okay. We have to think of the most effective way of dealing with such questions. So understand they actually have, they actually have stuff. Now, notice here, those who leave Islam are executed. Objection to Islam is often raised against the death penalty prescribed for apostates, which is abandonment of religion. In fact, the reason you are killed is that when you say the Shahada, this is a contract. Now, I'm going to get the words wrong here, so don't, so don't, don't quote me 100% and go, Ah, oh, we got you, Lloyd. You made a mistake. Yeah, Lloyd lies. It's been a while since I looked at it, but when you say the Shahada, when you, when you look at the whole terms of the agreement, that the contract that you are verbally making with Allah, it is. It falls under. A condi- it, in fact, it falls under commerce. Believe it or not, the, the terms of that contract fall under commerce. Now, why do you think that contract, Chris, would fall under commerce? Um, I'm not too sure. Because you're selling something. Okay. To okay. someone who's buying it. Does that sound familiar to you? From. Ah uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Right? There's a word for it. I can't remember the word right now, but basically it is, um, the word will come to me eventually, but you are selling your, what are we selling, Chris? Wait, 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 hang on. Let's have a look. Those who leave Islam are executed. Objection to Islam. I'm looking at the comments. Uh, Thaddeus uh, came back to us about the the inspired okay. person, and I was just reading this. <clears throat> So Inspired never did finances. He came back a year later with, lol, you are still at this. I realized it is pointless to defend Islam, which I think is, uh, is pretty cool. Yeah, I know Seth says, please, Lloyd, can you have a session with CP? He, he's a one-man army. Pardon me, he works on his own. Look, besides, put it this way. You may as well say, Lloyd, can you please call the president and do a live stream with the president? You may as well say, <laughs> Lloyd, phone Bill Gates and, and do a live stream with Bill Gates. Have Bill Gates fund you. You know, Lloyd, go ask Richard Branson for money and have Richard Branson give you a studio. Um, dude, it's like the fact that he's on the internet and I'm on the internet is about as relevant that I'm on earth and he's on earth. It doesn't mean I know him, talk to him, or he wants to deal with me. Understand, please. It doesn't work like that. So notice they will say openly here, since religion in Western civilization looks at it is a personal choice, which cannot be enforced by church or state, to execute a person for leaving his religion would naturally seem extreme, but this is normal under Islam <laughs> to kill them. Because you have signed a contract. It's a verbal contract, but basically you have committed a crime of breaching of breach of contract because you have sold your soul. Under what right, conditions in Christianity right. do we sell our souls? Or at least not Christianity, but in Western in Western theology. You sell your soul to Satan. Exactly. Yeah. And now you have walked away from that and thus you are killed for that. Western civilization executes its citizens for giving away state secrets, something material. Islamic law prescribes the death penalty for something far more serious, rebellion against God. This is a far greater crime than rebellion against state secrets. No compulsion in religion, for sure. Yeah, they, they, they love this analogy. Um, whenever you talk, if, they, if they're honest enough to talk about this and defend this, which is a question in and of itself, they always go to, look, it's just the same as a, a state's natural right to deal with terrorism, to deal with those who... Uh, engage in in acts that are harmful towards the state. You you would you have death penalty for that in a lot of places. Therefore, why is it so much of a stretch to think of it for um for leaving religion? But there is there is no way on earth that any reasonable person can believe that that even makes sense. Like how 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 do you think that? Yeah. So um I was uh, taking state secrets related to like nuclear material uh, and I was selling them to China. That's on the same level as saying I am no longer a Muslim. How yes. on earth do you even rationalize that? Yeah. Well, it's, and they do. It's, it's, and they do. Okay. Completely bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So look, I don't have to go through this. Um, okay. Just, just notice that these guys are taught Dawah to deal with these difficult things. Is God, they change it to sent by God. The son of God, a human messenger of God. Tell them they're now closer to Islam and Christianity. You know, do they believe that he was a, a messenger? You know, did Jesus complete his message? Well, his message was incomplete, okay? So they have this whole, they've got their tricks of dealing with this, okay? This is something that they learn. So I'm not going to go into all of this, but, um, I mean, read the screen later, or I have actually, Thaddeus and I did a show talking about Dawah techniques, and I should do an updated one on that, okay? So did you know there's only one religion which says that Jesus was sent by Almighty God? Do you know what religion? So they have a whole script that will talk you through. 
understand the scripts exist. <laughs> Look surprised. I love it. They've even like predicted the response. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm. So understand to deal with all of this, this stuff that they cannot defend, they, they, they have to, I mean, yeah. So classical commentary, the Holy Quran, Tafsir Qurtubi, he speaks again. The word disgrace refers to killing in the case of the Harbi and jizzy in the case of the Dimi. You must be disgraced, humiliated. They will have disgrace in this world and in the next world, a terrible punishment. So in this world, okay, killing in the case of the Harbi and jizya for the Dimi. If you submit to them, you pay jizya. If you fight them, you get killed. This is it, right? As for cursing unbelievers in general, there is no disagreement about doing that since Malik reported a statement going back to blah, 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 blah. People definitely used to curse the unbelievers in Ramadan. Whether or not they are dummies, this is not mandatory, but it is permitted because they <laughs> deny the truth and are hostile towards the deen and they do things like drinking wine and they consume usury. Islam also has usury. They just give it a different name. They, they're guilty. They're hypocrites. But understand it is okay to curse non-Muslims, especially during Ramadan. Curse the Christians. Wow. That's so hypocritical. Yeah. It's just no words can, can't really describe that. It's reprehensible. Okay. Yeah. So they say here, as for those who, from whom harm is feared in respect of planning, advice, and monetaries, the, the ruler can choose between five options. Killing, an act of goodwill, ransom, enslavement, or agreeing to become a dummy for jizya. So this just goes on and on. In practice, payment of these taxes amounted to an acknowledgement of social inferiority. That's from Al-Tabari. The dummies, a mark of their social and religious degradation and second-class citizenship compared with Muslim Arabs. This is called apartheid. I come from an apartheid state, right? Now, people will lie to you whole day, every day about apartheid, and I've been very blunt about that. There's another side to the story. Most of what you know about apartheid is just propaganda, and I have very little time for that. But that said, in Israel, Muslims have full rights. Whereas if you go to, as a dummy, do you think you've got full rights? No, you do not. You are a second-class citizen, according to al -Tabri. The poll tax is a favor that the Muslims do for their non-Muslim subjects, one for which you should be grateful, Chris. <laughs> wow. Nice. And the poll tax here is, is in reference to jizya. Yes, the poll tax okay, is yeah, yeah, jizya's yeah, poll tax. I thought it was. Uh, wow, yeah. Should, should be grateful for it. Wow. Yeah, so... Okay, with the proceeds are directed to an unlawful use, such as building a church. Well, this is not just taxes. You cannot use it. Or purchasing lamps for a church. This assists in disobedience to Allah. The same is true of, a, of an endowment for printing the Torah or New Testament, which is invalid because the Jews and Christians have altered the text and interpolated spurious material. In other words, they've added junk into the Bible. And you may not print their scriptures. Doing so is to participate in their disobedience to Allah. Right, so they're telling you why they're doing this. So this, this gives further context to why they are you're being punished. Jizya, remember, is a punishment. Okay, yeah? Yeah, to uh, feel yourself humbled and subdued. Yes. So, yeah, you guys can look. I'm not going to go through this. This is very lengthy, but you can go through these. I've got Tafsir on Jizya. Okay, and here. So you guys can always check these later, or I can drop them into the, into the um, description later. Uh, Muslims always want to be treated with special care when they are in other countries, so much that even banks have created Sharia-compliant products that no one has the rights in Islamic states. Exactly. You can see th they are the, the founders of apartheid like this. Churches do need to learn the truth about Islam. That is correct, Latia. Yes. Yes. Check on the playlist and Lloyd's channel. Okay, so moving on. So this has... Um, okay, so let's talk, look at the Hedaya. We're going now to the older version of the Hedaya. This is volume 2, the Hedaya. This is the largest, over two and a half thousand pages, the most complex of the Sharia manuals that, that I know of that are taught to the Imams. Thefts which occasion amputation and on the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief, you'll learn that yes, this does happen to you. This is described in the law. In fact, there's like one verse in the Quran that talks about it, but there's like 50 pages in the Hedaya that discusses it in great detail. They have the manner of waging war and of plunder and the division thereof. Plunder, that's what pirates do. They speak of the conquest of infidels, from page 180. They speak of tithe and tribute, and then separately of jizya, or capitation tax, and the laws concerning apostates, because those laws also relate to dhimmis. The same laws apply. 
Okay, <clears throat> grateful for paying Muslims to humiliate and subjugate you. Wow, yes, Crunchy, that's exactly what they say in their law. Okay, so now let's have a look at the Al Hadaya. Okay, uh, let's go back here. Sorry, the importance of this book cannot be exaggerated. It is studied in most Hanafi based schools and Islamic universities. It is a comprehensive and detailed book, widely used, to blah, blah, blah. This is. This is a classical book of Islamic jurisprudence. And blah, blah. This is just a very, very important book. The Hidayah has dominated the field of Islamic jurisprudence since the day it was written. It has been the primary text used by Muslim jurists to issue authentic and reliable rulings of Islamic law. Okay, Hidayah commands such an authoritative position that the knowledge of a scholar who has not read it is not considered reliable. I mean, just blah, blah, blah. This book is critically important in Islamic jurisprudence. It is that important. Okay, the Dai yeah. is celebrated as the most practical and useful compilation of Hanafi jurisprudence. It's a standard, bloody, bloody, bloody. Understand? So we're just just giving you the bona fides of the Hedaya. So you can just go back later, look at the slides, because as an apostate, he has forfeited the protection of the law, just as the dummy, right? When he breaks the law, so. So the tribute signifies the product of lands, the hire of slaves. And it's a tax imposed upon the persons of dhimmis, which is termed jizya or capitation tax. We are enjoined, ordered in the law, to make war upon the infidels until they embrace the faith. We have subdued Iraq. We have imposed tribute upon the land. We have imposed tribute upon the inhabitants. We impose tribute upon the people of Syria. So as they spread, they impose this. The Imam, whenever he subdues a territory by force of arms, is entitled to impose tribute upon their lands and capitation tax upon their persons. Interesting. It's nice to have like um, a very highly thought of historical account that clearly says, yep, we impose tribute, yep, we did all this stuff. It's nice to have a reference to that. Yeah, Robert Jansen asked, why didn't Muhammad command the destruction of the Bible and the Gospels? Um, because he didn't have originals. There was no complete New Testament at all. Um, I mean, but look, besides, the, it was too widely spread. I don't think they properly saw until they got to Spain that they actually properly took a look at the Bible. If you look at all the Christology in the Islamic sources, it's all Gnostic. Hmm. Yeah, I have some questions about that as well. It, 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 I'm still struggling with the question of how to properly understand what Islam, uh, Islam's relationship is to Christians in the very, very beginning. Because, um, I mean, I'm not talking about during Muhammad's time as such, but rather after that, when it spread, the historical account. Because th there's there are supposedly historical references that say that basically some Christians didn't see them as a totally new religion, but rather a heretical religion. That would and, make sense. I mean, we've spoken about this on my channel with Thaddeus when I've gone through that. There seems to be an ecumenical movement. They seem to have come out of a theologically sort of messianic Jewish leaning, but a heretical slash Gnostic. Yeah. Leaning. And I wonder if a lot of that was to sort of justify the position they had put themselves in, which is like they now have dominion over all these Christians and Jews. So what do you do with them? It's like, well, well you have to relate they... to them. Sorry, go on, sorry. Well, you, you, you kind of have to have some way that you live with them, right? So it's kind of like, well, we're your overlords and we're going to impose jizya on you and we have all these rules, we have the sharia, but at the same time, we kind of want to claim that, you know, we are sort of just like you in the sense that, yeah, we affirm the Injil and Torah, but maybe it took them a while to figure out exactly what that was and then the sort of dean evolved into thinking, well, actually, yeah, uh, we can't say that anymore because we know what's in the Injil and Torah and it completely contradicts the Quran. Yeah, I mean, I'd love a Muslim to please send me a copy of the Injil. I, I lost my copy. It was My dog ate it. If you could just send me a copy of the Injil, <laughs> I'd, you know, Mo, Mo obviously kept a copy because it was very important. So if you just show us one copy, we'll believe you, right? So just, it's a real book. So just send, send me a copy. Um, PDF is fine, and I'll, I'll be glad to, uh, to uh, admit my error. Thanks. Just uh, to Arnold, um, Nathaniel, uh, yeah, I've made a note of St. John of Damascus and Al-Kindi. Yeah, he, um, so yeah, yeah, he makes this, St. John of Damascus speaks about the Arianism within the Islamic message. And okay. um, and there's other connections as well to, to earlier Gnostics, to Mani. And so yeah, there's a, there's a distinctly um, Gnostic heretical flavor to it. 
In fact, if you look at it, there's a syncretism. There's definitely a strong syncretism. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it's stuff for me to learn. So uh, that's on my list. Yeah, it's it's uh, now I'm not I'm not prepared with my notes, and I'm I'm not like my brain is like not switched on to those things right now. So, <laughs> but it's it's, it's no, longer discussions yeah, I've yeah. had with, on Thaddeus's channel as well about this stuff. But that's something we can talk about in the future. I mean, definitely. So, so the imam subdues by force of arms, and these people are subject to tribute. Okay, necessity that something be imposed and deducted from the subsistence of the infidels. Okay, and it bears the construction of a punishment. It is a sort of hardship, tax upon tribute land being due, although he should not have cultivated it. Um, so even though you have not cultivated land and made money or profit of it, you still owe for it. Okay, and the prophet has conquered that territory by force of arms. Apparently, I thought he did so peacefully, but whatever. And they speak of <laughs> Jama Sagi that all land subdued by force, force of arms is subject to tribute. So yeah, this is this is martial law being imposed. Yeah, that's this, that's exactly how I was thinking. The, the terminology as well, like to pay tribute. Yeah, yeah this is all war law, you know, military law. They say of jizyat or capitation tax, it is of two kinds. The second species is that which the imam himself imposes where he conquers infidels. Conquers, not politely convinces them. The Prophet spoke generally without making any distinction that capitation tax is due in lieu of destruction. By destruction they mean your death. Capitation right. tax serves as an aid to the troops. It pays their army for their further conquest. Capitation tax is due of assistance with person and property. So if you won't go and kill and be killed for Allah, give us your money. Your thoughts, Chris, before we wind down? We're winding down last eight slides. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no thoughts just on that one. Let's let's continue. Okay, so it is imposed upon kitabis. Okay, so it is imposed by force, right? Capitation tax is imposed because this is mentioned in the Quran. So according to the most highly regarded Islamic law manual, right? This is what it tells us. Okay, Shafi said, okay, it is imposed as a return from the mercy and the forbearance shown by the Muslims as a substitute for the death which is due upon infidels. As a substitute for the death, it is due from yeah. Right, okay. They say destruction, yeah. but they mean death. Wow. Okay, namely, that assistance which every subject of the Muslim government is by law enjoined to afford towards carrying on the enjoined war with infidels. Enjoined means commanded. Allah commands them to make war upon all non-Muslims. And if you won't join their army, well, give them the money so that they can raise a more powerful army and go make further war. Right? So, and he argues, Shafi argues that destruction, death, is incurred by all infidels. Okay? But in consideration, you can pay the capitation tax. So they should kill you, but we'll take your money instead. <laughs> yeah. And he says, subject to the original penalty, which is destruction. So the argument of our doctors is that it is lawful to make slaves great stuff. By reducing them to slavery, they're deprived of power over their own persons. They're deprived of power over their own persons by the imposition of capitation tax, the jizya, and pay the Muslims the produce of their labor. Your thoughts about the morality of this? Absolute evil. Yeah. Yeah, so either we make you a dimmy or you become a slave and... Yeah, and if any of those two, we kill you. And that's that's all you get in life. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just really glad that this isn't something that, like globally, Muslims are in a position to enact, that there isn't a caliph that actually is doing this sort of thing, like uh, nationwide and, and doing it in Christian lands. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that you, there are Christians who are being killed in places like Nigeria and, and, and the horrible things that are happening. But, it, you know, if... I'm thinking of like the Ottoman Empire and stuff. I'm thinking of like the last caliph. I'm thinking like, yeah, I'm glad that at least that part's over. Yeah. Um, so Romeo Sanchez made a... Ronan Ramirez, sorry, uh, wrote, Love of money is the root of all evil, and Allah loves money. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's, there's, um, there's lots of stuff uh, in the Quran, I think. Not the, not the Hadith, but in the Quran where... Allah is basically just asking for money. And the Jews used to take 
take the mick out of him because it's like, look, your God seems to really like money and keeps asking for all this money. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Scrunchy says, are Kitabi's hostages? Well, effectively, yes, you're a prisoner of war. Um, yeah. So George Esterhazen says, is all the information you guys have only going to stay in the small YouTube platform? I mean, depends what you do with it. I mean, put it yeah. this way. I used to have one subscriber. I'm doing a slightly <laughs> better today. You're doing a lot better today. So, um, well, I'm I'm hoping to to study this and to actually bring this up uh, at the corner, um, and hopefully that will get more coverage. Yeah, it's uh, like saying Jesus. You've only got twelve guys. Is this it? <laughs> Everything takes time. Everything takes time. You know, if a Muslim if a Muslim army subdues an infidel territory before any capitation tax is established, the inhabitants, together with their wives and children, are all plunder. Oh gosh, yeah. They are property of the state. And it is lawful to reduce to slavery all infidels. Yeah. So you are property of the state. As a dummy, you are quite literally the property of the state. You are plunder. You are the so you're the goose that lays the golden egg for them. Seeing so, it in the context of warfare is, is exactly the correct context to look at it at. Yeah. Yeah, understand. Muslims don't want to tell you this. So, I mean, I've been inviting them. Let's go through the Sharia. Let's read it. Let's just see how your scholars got it all wrong, right? Because the infidelity, so your disloyalty to Allah, is also an atrocious nature because they have apostatized. They've become infidels. This is for, for people who've left Islam. After having been led into the way of faith and made acquainted with Islam's excellence. <laughs> so they must, you know, maybe it's the excellence of that Milk and urine drink. Oh, I was I gonna know. say that they, they must have had, yeah, a bit of that urine drink and thought, hmm, it doesn't taste so excellent to me. Yeah, and then so they must embrace the faith or be put to death. Shafi holds that it is lawful to make slaves of the idolaters of Arabia. Well, I mean, I guess equal opportunity slavery, I guess it's okay, at least that's evil or evenly spread slavery for everyone. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if a Muslim army conquers the idolaters of Arabia or apostates, their wives and children are plunder. Sadiq made slaves of the women and children of the blah, blah, blah tribe when they apostatized and divided those slaves among the troops and slew such of the men as did not return to the faith for the reasons before assigned. So this is like the apostasy wars. <coughs> so yeah, capitation Wait. tax is a substitute for destruction. For them. And with respect to us, it is a substitute for aid in the wars of the faith. Holy war. So, capitation right, tax right. goes towards holy war. So, you're going to give us this capitation tax as, you know, a substitute for death, which is destruction, or uh, respect to us. Yeah, it's just to help us further kill you. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. Oh. Yeah. Capitation tax may be imposed on those where they are capable of labor. A monk is not destroyed, not killed, where he does not mix with mankind. Okay, so he's not he's not proselytizing. And capitation tax with respect to them would be for the purpose of warding off destruction. We'll give you money, please don't kill me. That's the mafia. Likewise, capitation tax is the consideration for protection. Oh, protection money. <laughs> Secondly, capitation tax is a species of punishment. It is inflicted upon infidels on account of their infidelity, whence it is termed jiziat, derived from jizya, meaning retribution. This is Allah's retribution through the Muslims upon you for not being a Muslim. Punishments are instituted for the purpose of removing evil, which is removed by either death or Islam. You see? So it's yeah. death of Islam. Thirdly, capitation tax is a substitute for aid to the Muslims. So, yeah. Sounds fun. Capitation yeah. <laughs> tax is a sort of punishment inflicted for their obstinacy and infidelity. It must be exacted in a mortifying and humiliating manner. According to one tradition, the collector is to seize him by the throat, shake him, saying, pay your tax, dummy. It is therefore evident capitation tax is a punishment. And secondly, capitation tax is a substitute for death. Are your thoughts, any thoughts, Chris? Any... Yeah, the, the, whole, the guy grabbing the other guy by the throat and shaking him, shaking the, the dimmy and, and 
that's it's just so bizarre. That's it's so. Oh man, I, I would I would ashamed to have that as like a history, like as a history of like, um, oh yeah, you know, as part of our dean, as part of our religion, we we generally thought this was great. We we found no issue with this. And it's like, well, yeah. No, so I mean, this also goes in the. Remember the first episode we spoke of Reliance of the Traveler, where the guy says the jizya is collected with humility and kindness, <laughs> and I said the guy was lying. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, guys, if you if you enjoy the content, um, a please do like, do share, subscribe, and also Chris's uh, channel link on the within the description and within the title of video, his link. Click it; that'll take you to his channel. Please also subscribe to his channel follow his work chris your thoughts i mean how would you recommend that the audience uses this information well what are your thoughts on how we can get bang for the buck out of knowing this how we can use so, this what i what i really am interested in for me what the next level is is actually to translate this into rhetoric it's about knowing how to present this in an argument in a way that takes common objections and deals with them swiftly and quickly um, because knowing this information is kind of, in my view, half of the battle, because you can know this stuff. And, and a lot of people, I think, kind of already, you know, if you ask the average person on the street, what do you think of Islam? They'll probably be like, oh, yeah, I know you can chop the hands off. There's, there's a Sharia thing. They, they understand little little bits of it. When you dive into it, that's when you get the material like Lloyd has here that you can then use to present it like a, in a solid argument. And I think for me, what I'm looking to do now and what I would encourage others to do is to think about how if you have conversations with Muslims, if you're in evangelism or if you're if you're into polemics, whatever it might be, maybe you're on Clubhouse and you have debates, is just how do I take this? How do I formulate it in a way that gives me quick delivery, that gets straight to the point and that just refutes any nonsense like, oh, well, you know, uh, it's just like um, just protection, right? You know, protect you from any enemies. We look after you. All you got to do is pay this little tax. And it's such a little tax. It's not a big tax. You know, that kind of nonsense. Prepare ourselves for that and be able to just demolish it, right? Put it under the feet of Jesus and say, no, that's not true. That's a lie. Here are your sources. Uh, have efficient and quick ways to quote them. So what I'm doing now uh, is I actually have on my phone, I actually have quick links to specific materials, I think pretty sure all of them, apart from one, comes from you, Lloyd, that references these documents and then it, it has them highlighted and it goes straight to that part in the document so that I can read it on demand. And um, one of the reasons I do that is because I promise you, when you get into the meat of this stuff, you, you're going to be asked by Muslims to prove what you're saying. They're going to say to you, oh, what, the Reliance of the Traveler says X, Y, and Z about prepubescent boys and girls. Well, prove it. And when you do, I promise you, you're going to wish you had that link. Um, and you're going to be very grateful when you do, because it is, it is amazing when you can just refute quickly. And, and that's where I think this, this needs to be taken next. Yeah, no, excellent. Yeah. Also, I mean, as we've spoken about before, there's a reason Muslims will not meet with me. I mean, they point blank refuse. In fact, they won't admit that they, you know, they just won't acknowledge the fact that I've said, okay, fine. You said I'm wrong. Let's do this. Let's meet. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what's amazing here is you have all this material, all highlighted, all indexed. You can go straight to this in a matter of seconds, right? You know, if someone joined this live stream, if it was a Muslim, it'd be game over for them. It'd be so so embarrassing. Uh, I think what a lot of uh, a lot of the time what happens is Muslims take advantage of um, of difficulty to bring resources up. It, sometimes it's quite hard to get these things, like it, like in the heat of the moment. Um, so that's kind of what I, I, I really want to focus on. Um, and I've got my own little way of doing it, but I want to improve and it might be good actually for me to do a video just talking about best ways of referencing material, just doing it in a really mm -hmm. quick way. Cause, uh, you know, if you're in a debate, it's very hard to be like, hang on a sec, let me just bring up that Lloyd video, du -du 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 -du. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, that's, that's the next step. I think actually, you know what, um, let me bring something up. Muslims have, guys, um, just a, just aside, but everyone's talking about Christian Prince. Christian Prince, notice, doesn't do collabs with anybody, right? Now, I'm aware that you guys watch it, but this is Lloyd's channel right now. You, you're dealing with me, so so that's nice, but, you know, just uh, let, let's, let's deal with my material. Christian Prince doesn't do collabs with other people. He does his own thing on his own time. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to approach him. He's not going to approach me. The fact that we're all on YouTube doesn't mean we're all friends and we, we have Sunday lunch together. Okay. So, um, and some people actually will not talk to me at all for whatever reasons. I have no idea why, but there are people that absolutely positively refuse to talk to me. 
Okay. Some of them may have been quite rude. Okay. I'll be blunt. Some of them have been more than just a little bit rude. So, so yeah, I didn't know Christian Prince, but I mean, great. You know, are we here to advertise Christian Prince or dealing with this material? And also, at one point I must make, Christian Prince, everyone tells me, Lloyd, Christian Prince studied the Sharia. You know, he actually went and studied at the university. Show me evidence. On this point, I'd love, show me the evidence. If Christian Prince has studied the Sharia, I haven't seen one shred of it in his videos. Not a little bit. Okay, so if I've missed it, please show me where. I show the Sharia all the time, chapter and verse, book after book. Do show me where Christian Prince shows the Sharia. If I'm wrong, please show me. <clears throat> okay, on this point, Muslims have, this one is called, this book has a particular name. It is, um, this one is called, oh, good grief. In Defense of Islam, Volume 2. Okay, so this has a whole series of arguments to defend Islam. How to use this book. They speak about this. I'm not going to go into length on this. How to find how to find deleted links and so on. So this is something that Muslims refer to. So they'll say, okay, basics of Islam, how to answer allegations, proving the essentials, raise arguments raised by atheists, proving the preservation of the Quran. Go to page 39. Okay, let's see what's on page 39 about that. Uh, let's see if there's actually anything of value there. Proving preservation of the Quran. Understanding it refutes many allegations. History of the Quranic text, the archive.org, blah blah blah. M al Azami, blah blah blah. Concise list of Arabic manuscripts on the Quran. This is, so they've got, Thaddeus and I have gone through a couple of different books that do exactly this, okay? That discuss how Muslims do their dawah, how they do their polemics, how they do all their arguments and blah, blah, blah. So you need to go look at these lists, these links yourself and see what they refer to and how they're going to defend themselves. Removing doubts about the manuscript variants. This YouTube video, this, you see this, your thoughts on this, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, actually to be honest with you I was kind of uh, impressed they didn't say perfect preservation of the Quran they just said preservation of the Quran uh, which which makes me smile just a little bit um, I swear I have actually taken a look at this very briefly because um, I think you may have mentioned this on other videos you've done so I, I think that none of this is uh, in any way good arguments for Islam um, I think a lot of it is just desperately trying to take mm. advantage of people's ignorance or just waffling on about things. Um, let's have a look. Uh, differences. Okay, so they admit there's manuscripts, uh, different manuscripts. That's good. Um, I'll be interested to see what they say about that, but I, oh, maybe it leads to Dr. Shabir Ali's video on it. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, so Scripture says, CP studied Islamic law, not Sharia. Oh, oh, so, so we're doing two different things. So the Sharia is not Islamic law. I was wondering that. Yeah, I was. Like, um, hmm. no. Okay. Um. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. So, so in other words, um, so so Thaddeus studies the later books of the Bible, whereas Chris does the New Testament. They're two <laughs> different things. Okay. So Thaddeus yeah. is talking about the later books of the Bible that came after Jesus. And Chris does the New Testament. Don't confuse the two. They're separate, separate things. The Sharia is not Islamic law. Um, as I said, there's the fiqh and there's the Sharia. I've discussed this at length on my channel in the past. So, so look, I mean, if I'm wrong, please explain to me the difference between what he's doing and what I'm doing. Because I have seen this much, zero, absolute zero of him discussing Islamic law. Maybe I missed that episode. Maybe I missed those in the dozens of episodes I've watched. If he does speak about Islamic law, fiqh, please direct me to it because I haven't seen it yet. But everyone tells me he studied Islamic law. He goes through Islamic law. No, he goes through the Sharia. He goes through the Hadiths. I've never seen him go through the fiqh. I might have missed it. If I'm wrong, please show me. But but please don't tell me that Sharia is not fiqh, is not Islamic law. Please. Uh, okay, moving on. So just the thing here as well, uh, Daniel Brubaker refuted. Uh, so I've had oh. I've had them bring that up to me on a few occasions at the park because I really don't like Dr. Daniel Brubaker's work because he basically just takes, uh, he literally just goes, finds manuscript variants and just makes notes of them. That's basically what he does. Mm -hmm. um, but they they absolutely hate this guy. And I can guarantee you in that, res that response, there'll be something about how they don't like his methodology and that Dr. Haitham Sidki made a, a, a rebuttal to him. Uh, but it's all kind of silly. Uh, yeah, I won't say more about that, but I, I laughed a little bit when I saw that one. 
Yeah. So, I mean, so this is, so yeah, so this is the kind of work that they go through. This is the kind of thing that they teach. Okay. So learn about this, understand that these things exist. Um, this is all in my, my collections online. So, okay, let's finish this last couple of slides. The construction of churches or synagogues in the Muslim territory is unlawful. This is forbidden in the traditions. Dhimmis should not be permitted to celebrate the tokens of infidelities. In other words, Christian services and ceremonies are not allowed to be made public. And dhimmis are prohibited from constructing churches. So this, to me, just is just a clever way of basically ensuring that churches eventually just die. Yes. Because if you can't build new stuff and you can't repair churches, yeah. then what you're effectively left with is, okay, well, the ones you've got now are just going to fade away over decades or centuries and that will be it. <laughs> Yeah. Your Highness, thank you for that point. He says, stop trying to put one Christian brother against another. CP does what he does. Lloyd does what he does. Yeah. Indeed. So, so yeah. And right now, look, I mean, I'm not going to go on Chris's channel and say, hey, hey, did you see that 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 great channel of this guy Thaddeus? Don't worry about this Chris guy. You know, let's, let's talk about Thaddeus. <laughs> I mean, that that's just, you know, it's just not how it's done, right? Um, and um, someone said, yeah, Tony said, I'd rather be an atheist than be a Muslim. Uh, on that point, if you look at the founding principles of atheism, look at its founders, but if you look at the principles, the enlightenment principles of atheism, and then you go to the Church of Satan, and you look at their principles, you'll find that those principles are what is known as identical. <laughs> okay, And I'm not kidding. I wish I were, but it's true. That's if you interesting. Look, if you've seen my Sharia series, my Sharia series, my <laughs> atheism series, you will find that the Atheism was originally designed and constructed as a religion. It is, it's a denial, it's an inversion, denial. It is, the whole idea was basically to present Catholicism without anything that is, anything that is, that is holy, right? To use these ideas and it is, it was sold as a religion. Many people saw it as a religion, its founders going back to its beginnings, saw it as a religion. And it is really, if you look at it, these enlightenment principles, it's, a, it's an anti-religion, effectively. It's the inverse, the opposite. And it, it is identical to the founding principles of the Church of Satan. And I'm not kidding about that. So, okay, so let's continue. It behooves the imam to make a distinction between Muslims and dummies in dress and equipment. It is not allowable for dummies to ride upon horses or to use armor or the same saddles or wear the same garments or headdresses as Muslims. In fact, you have to wear wooden saddles. They have to wear the kiftage openly. So in other words, just like the, the, under the Nazis, Jews have to wear the little yellow star, you have to do the same. And it's a woolen cord or belt which the dummies wear around their waists on the outside of their garments. If they ride upon an animal, okay, they must have a saddle like that of an ass, not like the nice saddle of a horse. Muslims are to be held in honor, contrary to dummies who are not to be held in honor. They are not saluted first. They're not greeted first. If there are no outward signs to distinguish Muslims from dummies, then dummies might be treated with the same respect as Muslims, which is not allowed. Your thoughts, Chris? Yeah, uh, I remember this from uh, Tafsir Ibn Kathir on Surah 929. He, he says very similar things to this. I think this expands on it, though, because I never heard the, the saddle made of wood. That's that's an interesting one. I, actually, I think you you brought it up in the the first um, the first video we did. But yeah, like uh, it's it's always interesting to go over just how obvious this stuff is. It's all about perception, all about how some people are just lesser people. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay, guys. So do you understand? I know that I say things that are usually very blunt. At least no one has to wonder what I'm thinking. I mean, I'm pretty blunt and clear about things. Again, I, I did not come at this as someone who was in the church and in a little ivory tower. I was in the Middle East. I spent 11 years there. I've traveled extensively across all of the Middle East. I've seen numerous Middle Eastern countries. I've seen the entire Gulf. I've been to Qatar like 20 times, right? I've been to Saudi Arabia, you name it. I've, I've been to Jeddah. I've been to Taif. I've been all over the Saudi Arabia. This stuff is a serious problem. So I don't come at it as an intellectual challenge. These people will kill you. My job is to make sure they didn't kill people. I have a very different perspective. I, I do not have the patience. My job is not to go, well, Chris has a different role in this. Chris might want to intellectually discuss with someone. I know how dangerous this is. Okay, My job is to make sure that that Muslim over there is not going to murder this guy over here. 
that's a whole different set of problems with a whole different set of solutions. So, so my perspective is very different, and I'm, I'm going to be very blunt about this. For me, this is a matter of urgency. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah. It is requisite that the wives of dummies be kept separate from the wives of Muslims, both on public roads and also in the baths. It is requisite that a mark be set upon their dwellings. And dummies are not permitted to ride at all, except in the case of absolute necessity. And if allowed to ride, he must stop riding and get off his horse, his donkey actually, not allowed to ride horses, whenever he sees any Muslims assembled. And if he must use a saddle, it must be made in the manner of the panniers of an ass, and dummies of the higher orders must be prohibited from wearing rich garments. And the thing in virtue of which the destruction of dummies is suspended, in other words, the thing in virtue of which the destruction, the death of dummies is suspended, is submitting to the jizya, or we will kill you. So it's not the actual payment that's important, it's the fact that they submit. And the submission continues even if they don't pay, right? And the contract, notice it is a contract of subjection, where you're, you're, you are humiliated, is merely a substitute for belief. Uh, any thoughts on that, Chris? So yeah, uh, Shafi has laid the contract of subjugation. It is different to his he's blaspheming the prophet. Faith will be broken, hence the same interpretation is thereby broken. Right, yeah, so if you blaspheme the prophet, all this is all this contract is null and void. If you uh, if you say anything negative about Muhammad. Yeah. So I was just reading the I was reading the bit in the middle there. But um Yeah, this is just just crazy. The thing in virtue of what? Yeah. So yeah. there's almost... not much more else to say about this, I think. Like this is so um it's so horrible what this is. And it's just more evidence that it's it's acceptable across across the board, regardless of, of like madhab and, and things like this. It's just Yeah. And if they are at peace with you, right, then then jizya is obligatory. So the welfare that you're paying, as someone mentioned in France, Germany, the UK, the welfare that you're paying Muslims, that's jizya. Right? And if there's no jizya, there'll be violence. Though there's still violence, because violence is also still required, because they haven't conquered the whole country yet. And that is an interesting way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. No, it's it's what you owe them. And a dummy upon breaking... Look, a mosque is conquered territory. A mosque is like a diplomatic mission. You know, when you have a, when you put down a, an embassy, that yeah. territory belongs to the foreign country. That's exactly what's happening with the mosque. It's a foreign yeah. mission. It's an embassy. And a dummy upon breaking his contract of subjection, okay, stands in the same predicament as an apostate. He is condemned to death. So the same rules that apply to prisoners of war applies to apostates. It is a contract, and they will kill you. If the dummy is made captive, he is a slave. Contrary to the case of an apostate, who if, he's, if he repents not, is put to death. So further confirmation of the death penalty for these guys. Of zakat, twice as much is levied upon the property of Christians as is levied upon the property of Muslims, because Omar made peace with them upon this condition. And in the presence of other companions, none of whom disputed it. Twice as much is taken from the women of that tribe as from the Muslims, because the above peace established the taking of double zakat, and zakat is incumbent upon women. This is jizyat, and name it whatever you please, jizyat or zakat. I was going to say, they're calling it zakat, but that's not, that's not correct, right? They're just sort of, yeah, they're using that as a term. And zakat Technically, it's two different things, but you can see non-Muslims pay double. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Interesting. But I mean, okay, yeah, I was going to say, both both Zakat and um, Jizya both go uh, exclusively to Muslims. Yeah, so, so that finishes that. So that completes that story. Um, <clears throat> you say story. More, more like a nightmare, I guess. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's, good to, it's good to know all this stuff. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, guys, I, man, my perspective on this, again, coming from a defense background, is very different. I, I view this in terms of national security. I view this in terms of geopolitics. Different perspective than me just arguing about the Bible. 
right? This is, this is threat doctrine. These people will kill you. I look at it like this. They're a threat. This is a genuine threat. So it's one thing to, to have intelligent discussions, but you're not dealing with people who are open to intelligent discussions. Um, because they're cheating you somehow. They're going to find a way and cheat you. They'll stab you in the back. That's how I view this. And that's my perspective. It's may, it might not be for everyone, but I do need people to understand. We, we cannot just be fooled by nice words and have them steal our resources and, and plot to overthrow our governments. I'll leave the final word to you, Chris, and uh, you can wrap up and uh, you know, whatever. Sure. Well, I was, I was just going to kind of, well, I share those sentiments. I think it's important to have different approaches, uh, not just mine, but many. I think being blunt is, is often a really, really good thing in this context, particularly in this context, because this is important stuff. People do need to know what actually is at the root of a dean of, of this religion. Um, and I think Lloyd has done an amazing job in doing that and continues to do so. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a totally different person from Lloyd. Um, you know, uh, my, my sort of role in this is more of a theological person who is representing Christ at a particular place in time, which is Speaker's Corner mostly, and giving these resources out. Um, but, you know, that doesn't say anything about whether one person is more important in one area than another. You know, we're all just doing what we can, really. And uh, I think Lloyd is doing an amazing job. So, yeah, thank you very much, Lloyd. Very much enjoy being on this live stream. No, oh, thank you. Um, yep. Is there, is there anything that that you think? Well, I mean, would you like to do another stream, perhaps in the future again, discuss another topic? Would be something. Yes, of interest? I would love to because you are a fountain of knowledge, and um, this is kind of like having my own like private tutor for my own study. Thank you. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, to be like I said, I've I've been aware of your stuff and watching your stuff for wow, a long time now. It's it must have been years like but i mean the idea that i actually have this opportunity to just absorb things um and ask questions is is really something that i would never have dreamed of so yeah i would love to do another live stream i would love to pick another topic and uh go through your presentations and um yeah have the audience kind of like learn from that and and use that for their own benefit and their own conversations yeah, no, well, thank you. We can think of a topic where we can do so. But thank you, guys. Thank you to the audience. I, I do appreciate all the support. I, I do appreciate the, um, the, the questions, the, the comments. And, um, yeah, Chris, for your insight, your, your thoughts, and hopefully this is useful to you and everyone else out there to utilize this material, to understand that we've been lied to for so many years by Muslims who've also been lied to, sadly, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Nathaniel. Arnold, Nathaniel, have a good night. I know you're one hour ahead of me already back home. And yeah, so guys, unfortunately, Muslims may not know this, but to some degree, they're aware of this. They know that this is not, they know. I mean, they're taught to lie. They, they're given these dawah classes. They take them. Could I just yeah. have a quick story? Because you reminded me of this. I was going to say it earlier, but um, there, there was someone I know who, uh, who was a Muslim. They took their shahada. It was done quite publicly. Uh, by people who are uh, celebrities, so to speak, on YouTube, you know, millions of uh, views and stuff like that. And this person then apostatized, uh, I think about a month or two afterwards. And I had lots of chats with this person. This person told me what it was like being a Muslim, what it was like to have to do the the prayers and how they, see, they it just seemed very much nonsense and all just role based. And then the same person that helped this guy take his shahada I actually went up to him and said, you know, if there was a caliph, we would have had to have killed you for doing that, for leaving and apostatizing from Islam. But fortunately for you, there isn't a caliph, so we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to continue to call you back into Islam. Now, the bizarre thing is he actually did go back to Islam after that, which for the life of me, I don't understand. I, I And to be honest with you, the difference between who he was as an atheist and who he was as a Muslim is, is night and day. Um, and it's, it, it feels as if now he's, he's, he's shut his mind off. I've, I've had conversations with him. I actually brought up your material, Lloyd. I did, uh, um, the whole Surah 65 IF4, uh, you know, it's, it's permissible to divorce those who are prepubescent. And I went through the reliance of the traveler. I even brought up the Hadaya, I think. Um, and he, he just, just basically ignored all of it. It was quite sad, but it was caught on video. Uh, I I think it's on on Soko Film if anyone wants to see that. But yeah, 
just thought I'd bring that up because it was it was interesting to show that yeah actually they are aware of this they know that like apostasy is something you're meant to kill up for if someone leaves Islam they try and justify it in their own little way to make it palatable to the West but they know about it and they know we won't ex- <clears throat> they know we won't accept it yeah oh that's exactly that right they, that's why they they come up with these things because it needs to be palatable to the West I have a funny feeling if I go to some places in the Middle East they wouldn't feel the need to come up with all these theological explanations about, oh, we need a caliph, you need this. I think they'd be like, no, that's just what you do. That's just our religion. But in the West, things get a little westernized a little bit, just so it becomes more palatable. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the dawah. Dawah means, dawah translates as propaganda. That's the correct understanding of dawah. So, yeah, yeah guys, uh, I'll call it a night here. Thank you very much. Um, so tomorrow night I'll be on with Sam Shamoon and on Sunday I'm on with Thaddeus so guys we'll wrap it up here, thank you all very much and uh, yeah please learn this, use it, screenshot it ask questions um, and uh, yeah I will be, I'll be putting out more material soon so well, maybe see you tomorrow night on Sam Shamoon's channel, I'll be talking about paganism in Islam or Munotheism, the early pagan roots of Islam in Yemen and Ethiopia as well as the spread of paganism from Babylon so, yeah, to, we'll see you then, guys. So, thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Take care. Good night.